This video is going to be a quick overview of uh, the skeleton, not for say allied health majors who are studying this in depth. For uh, those students, for students who are at the deeper uh, interest, I have far more uh, videos. Um, this is just a quick overview uh, showing a synopsis of various major points. First off, uh, the bone and cartilage uh, which compose uh, the human skeletal system. These are living tissues. And so for example, cartilage, um, that's some hard amorphous substance. Uh, there are cells there, and there are different kinds of uh, cells uh, which are capable of growing in two different uh, ways. They can both grow uh, from the outside of the cartilage, adding more to the outer portions of uh, cartilage, much in the way that tree rings continue to uh, grow from the outside. But they can also uh, grow in the middle of the cartilage, uh, dividing and then um, making a cartilage uh, between the two uh, daughter cells. And this is a ventricle. Oppositional growth, growth from a gel, which is not quite as uh, solid uh, as that of uh, bone. So while bone will resist tension um, until it breaks, cartilage is not quite as strong. Um, but uh, it can bend. Uh, so these features of cartilage uh, give it certain advantages, which is why, for example, the bones of, say, the arms and the legs first form from cartilage and are later uh, converted into bone. Uh, the most common type of cartilage in the body is what's called hyaline cartilage. It makes up where the sternum joins the ribs or uh, in the bones of the arms and legs uh, before they um, become bone, or uh, it composes uh, structures like the trachea and uh, the larynx, uh, the tips of the bones where, say, um, uh, bones articulate with each other at, say, a movable joint, like the shoulder, the knee, the hip, uh, etc. Notice these are cartilage cells without any blood supply, uh, so they're just kind of living in little spaces known as lacunae uh, inside uh, the, uh, the matrix around them. Um, so I'll go on into uh, bone, uh, but there are different uh, types of uh, cartilage. So for example, uh, the cartilage where the two pubic bones meet or between uh, vertebrae or that type of cartilage which would be made as a uh, fracture heals is known as fiber cartilage. So structurally that's a little bit uh, different. And then the very flexible cartilage, say your external ear, or in the epiglottis, which folds over uh, the opening to uh, the larynx when we swallow food so that food does not enter an airway. Uh, that is elastic uh, cartilage uh, that is a, um, a different kind. So we do have these three different kinds of uh, cartilage uh, in our uh, bodies. Uh, once again, a living tissue like uh, bone, um, but with a different type of uh, substance, chondroitin sulfate, a bit more flexible, and unlike bone, it is uh, avascular. Bone is also a living tissue. It has stem cells, which can make both the progenitors uh, to make more bone, osteoblasts, but also uh, the progenitors uh, to make uh, cartilage, uh, chondroblasts. Um, uh, there are osteoblasts, which make bone, osteocytes, which maintain bone, and osteoclasts which dissolve bone. And so um, bone is a living tissue. Often we forget that because very often we, you know, say in a lab, we might look at dead bone, um, which is not the same as living bone uh, whatsoever. So while real bone in a living organism can have the strength of steel reinforced concrete, um, you know, the bone that you might see, which is, you know, dead bone, uh, that is uh, very different. Um, uh, bone is a connective tissue, and connective tissues have cells, uh, they have extracellular protein fibers, and they have uh, an extracellular uh, matrix. And so uh, about a quarter of bone is the protein collagen. So just as collagen can be found in, say, a tendon or a ligament uh, here, those are elastic fibers, um, collagen uh, is uh, found in uh, bone. Now, very often it's not visible, so you would have to remove the calcium salts of bone. So here's cartilage, which would also have uh, collagen. 
um, maybe up to 40%. Um, but if you could take the, um, the calcium salts out of bone, um, you would see that uh, collagen uh, can make up about a quarter of bone. Without uh, collagen, bone would be very brittle. So it's thanks to this mix. Uh, so here you see decalcified bone. And notice that there's stuff still there. This is the protein um, uh, matrix, uh, the extracellular protein uh, collagen. Uh, and so uh, all connected tissues, including bone and uh, cartilage, have uh, living cells. They have extracellular proteins like collagen. And then they have a matrix with, uh, which, with, in the case of, say, blood, is watery. But in the case of bone and uh, cartilage, is this solid... <coughs> Uh, matrix. Uh, so bone is very much alive, and that's one of the reasons it requires then its uh, blood supply. And as we talk about the remodeling of bone, it's the osteoblasts, uh, which are making new bone, the osteoclasts, which dissolve bone, and then the osteocytes, which are present uh, in bone um, uh, uh, when it's mature, as simply a maintaining um, now, we can uh, see different kinds of uh, bone uh, and classify it in different ways. So, for example, based on its structure, see under the microscope, we can distinguish between compact bone. So here's compact bone. Um, the holes you see are where the blood vessels go. So unlike cartilage, uh, bone is vascular, and maybe a liter of blood goes through our skeleton every couple of uh, minutes. Uh, we can see that there are cells here. Each of those uh, dark spots is a place where an osteocyte uh, is located. Um, but this structure uh, is what we call compact bone. Uh, this is what we would find uh, on the surface of all bones and also say in the shaft of uh, the long bones of say the arms and legs. And so some bone looks like this under the microscope. Here you can see holes for the osteocytes, the cells, uh, the blood vessels, but you know this is compact bone. Uh, but then there are other parts of our body where we have spongy bone. Um, it has a very different uh, structure and it has space uh, for either um, red bone marrow, and this is where blood cells are made, uh, or yellow marrow, which is stores adipose. We can find uh, spongy bone, uh, in addition to other places, at the ends of the long bones, what we call the epiphyses. Um, and uh, this means that here we have these bone struts, which can go in lots of different directions, uh, which is good because at the ends of bones, uh, stresses can come from multiple uh, directions. Uh, so uh, once again, I just want to zip to a, these two kinds of marrow in the red bone marrow, like you see here, uh, this is where blood cells are being made every single second in that second there. Um, the average person might have made, say, 3 million red blood cells, 4 to 6 million white uh, blood cells. And so this is what's occurring here. Whereas here, these big spaces, these are fat cells, which uh, then exist in a uh, yellow marrow. And uh, so uh, bone marrow can have those uh, two, um, uh, those, uh, two aspects. Um, so we can classify bone based on its structure. You know, it can be compact, it can be spongy. Uh, we can also classify bone based on how it forms. Something, uh, some uh, bones just form in the middle of, say, the dermis in the skin, where an area differentiates and then makes bone and the bone gets bigger. This is what's known as intermembranous ossification. And this is how we make, say, the bones of uh, the skull and a portion of uh, the clavicle. Whereas most of the skeleton starts off with a cartilage model first. Um, and so, uh, say the bones of the arms and the legs, the ribs, et cetera, uh, this then um, uh, begins in embryonic uh, development uh, with a cartilage model. And then this cartilage model gradually becomes bone uh, over uh, time. Um, uh, this, the fancy name for this is uh, endochondral ossification. Now, um, 
in uh, childhood, uh, the interesting thing about uh, endochondral ossification is that um, what was once a cartilage model then forms a bone uh, in the shaft from the first center of making bone, what's called the primary center of ossification. Um, but then at the ends of the bones, uh, then there are secondary centers of ossification which form, which leave then bands of cartilage uh, between them known as epiphyseal plates or what are commonly called growth plates. And then uh, during our uh, childhood and early teen years, uh, here uh, is where uh, growth is occurring. Um, uh, because uh, cartilage can grow from within, something that bone cannot do. And so then you have bone at these two fronts. Uh, you have you know, the primary center of ossification, the secondary center of ossification, and the bone can advance. But in this epithelial plate of cartilage between uh, the two, the cartilage is reproducing and reproducing and then pushing away the bone fronts. As long as this epiphyseal plate or growth plate uh, survives, then we can continue to grow because the, the cartilage pushes the bone away, the bone catches up, and thus now our limb has more bone in it. You know, our, you know we've gotten taller if uh, these are our limbs. Um, but uh, the cartilage is still there for more growth. Uh, at the end of uh, puberty, however, uh, the increase in the production of uh, estrogen and testosterone causes the bone to grow faster. And then at that point, uh, the uh, bone fronts catch up with uh, the cartilage and now uh, growth uh, stops as uh, the two uh, fronts fuse. And what was an epiphyseal plate of cartilage, which you can see here, then becomes an epiphyseal line where these two bone uh, fronts uh, meet. So once again, in the adult body, bone is bone, but it actually formed two different ways. The bone of the skull formed through uh, intermembranous ossification, whereas uh, the bone of the majority of the skeleton started off with a cartilage model uh, that then gradually became bone, very often over decades. Uh, and there was this a period where there was a growth uh, plate, an epiphyseal plate of cartilage, which then fused at the end of, uh, of puberty. Um, even here then there would still be cartilage at the ends of the bones uh, where the joints would be located. So where we have um, bone fronts articulating with uh, each other, that would be cartilage rubbing on cartilage rather than bone rubbing on uh, bone, uh, which would not uh, be advantageous. Um, and then uh, there are other concepts uh, with bone tissue that one might want to consider. And one is that we're constantly changing our skeleton to meet our needs. So if you start to exercise more, your bones will get thicker and stronger. If you are bedridden uh, and you exercise less, your bones will get thinner and weaker. Because we have osteoclasts here in red, multinucleate cells which can dissolve bone. So if you're not using a bone, it will get thinner and weaker. But we also then have osteoblasts, which make bone. And so we're constantly remodeling our skeleton. Our skeleton is far more dynamic than I think uh, many people uh, give it credit for. Uh, also, our skeleton uh, is a calcium store. And since we are constantly regulating the amount of uh, uh, of calcium in our bodies. We don't want our calcium to be too high nor too low. If you have too much calcium in your blood, uh, one of the ways you can get back to the level that you like is you can store more in uh, your skeleton. If your calcium is not as high as you would like, you can dissolve some of your skeleton. So we maintain a constant level of calcium in our blood um, using our skeleton in large part. Um, obviously, sometimes uh, bones can be uh, pushed uh, farther uh, uh, than they can bear when it comes to stresses. Uh, and at that point, uh, then a, a fracture can occur, which then heals in a number of steps. You know, first a blood clot is formed called a fracture hematoma. Uh, then a cartilage comes into the areas which lack a blood supply. Once again, cartilage is a vascular. So we uh, synthesize calluses of cartilage, both on the inside and uh, the outside. Um, these cartilage uh, calluses and then can become uh, bone. 
uh, so that uh, calluses of cartilage are converted to bony calluses. And then the bone is remodeled so that it has, you know, the same structure as before with uh, the lines of stress running, you know, in the appropriate uh, directions. Uh, and so there are a number of things which, you know, can be of, uh, you know, consideration in bone tissue, including then the problem of osteoporosis, which can uh, face people as they age um, because uh, we need our steroid hormones, estrogen and testosterone, um, uh, for a uh, bone to maintain itself. And as we increase in age, women after menopause, the levels of these hormones can drop, which could mean that bone decreases uh, to the point uh, where uh, uh, osteoporosis is a serious health problem. Obviously, if one uh, were hoping to perhaps study physical therapy or occupational therapy or radiology. Uh, one might then want to know all of the bones of the body. So just a quick introduction. That the first thing we do with the skeleton is split it into what's called an axial skeleton and an appendicular skeleton. Uh, the axial skeleton, uh, this is composed of uh, that which goes up and down the long axis of the body. The skull, the vertebral column, and then the thoracic cage. So those uh, parts that go up uh, and down the long axis of the body, the skull, vertebral column, and thoracic cage, uh, that is the axial skeleton. Meanwhile, the second uh, portion, which we call the appendicular skeleton, this is composed of the arm and the pectoral girdle, which attaches the arm uh, to uh, the axial skeleton, and then the leg and the uh, pelvic girdle, which attaches the leg to uh, the, um, uh, the axial skeleton. Uh, we can then identify uh, the bones of the skull. Uh, the first thing that we do is we split the skull into portions where the cranium is the part of the uh, skull which protects the brain in a bony box. Your uh, brain is very delicate, and so we have a number of uh, bones uh, which uh, directly surround uh, the brain. And it will vary which ones we see depending on how we're looking at the skull. So this frontal view will show different bones than we would see then in a lateral view or you know, a posterior view, uh, et cetera. Uh, now, this is just a quick overview. Obviously, these videos go into the uh, bones in greater detail. Other bones of the uh, skull uh, do not uh, uh, surround uh, the brain. And those then are the bones of the face, all right? And so the face would include the bones which hold the teeth, which make up portions of the orbit and surround uh, much of the uh, nasal cavity, uh, et cetera. And so uh, uh, if you were going to study the skull, at some point you would be uh, looking at, you know, the different uh, uh, bones and their uh, aspects. In addition to the bones of the uh, cranium and the face. Uh, then there are two other uh, bones uh, which are then uh, included. Uh, first, uh, the hyoid bone, which hangs from ligaments and uh, surrounds uh, the larynx, as uh, some tongue muscles uh, originate uh, here. And then also inside the temporal bone is the cavity which holds the middle ear. And there are three pairs, you know, uh, one set of three on either side. Um, of middle ear uh, bones, uh, which um, uh, help uh, amplify uh, sound. And so um, these then would be the bones of the skull. And then the skull is a portion of the axial skeleton running up and down the long axis of the body. Uh, uh, the vertebral column is the uh, next uh, uh, portion. Um, many of the vertebrae are individual separate bones, although in two areas uh, they have uh, fused. And if we wanted to uh, you know, uh, discuss the vertebrae, we could name certain parts. Uh, so there is a, a hole uh, uh, through which the spinal cord passes, just as the brain is protected by the cranium. Uh, the spinal cord is protected by the vertebrae because it's passing through this vertebral foramen. And there are uh, places where muscles uh, can, um, uh, can attach and then uh, holes, uh, the intervertebral foramen, once uh, vertebrae are uh, together, where nerves can leave 
etc. So there are a number of important um, uh, features of uh, vertebrae. We can then name sections of vertebrae. So for example, there are cervical vertebrae in uh, the neck, and the first two are especially interesting. Uh, the atlas, which holds up the skull, so the occipital bone of the skull rests right there. And then also the axis, uh, which has a protruding process known as the dens, uh, uh, which um, uh, the atlas can then rotate around. So when you shake your head, yes, it is the um, atlas moving relative to the skull. And when you shake your head, no, it is the atlas uh, revolving or rotating around uh, the dens of uh, the axis which allows uh, this uh, movement. Um, the thoracic uh, vertebrae, uh, there are 12 of these, each of which bears a, uh, a pair of ribs. So we have 12 ribs in our uh, body, and thus we have 12 thoracic vertebrae, uh, which uh, they articulate with. So here you can see there are 12 pairs of ribs. And then this section of the uh, vertebral column is the uh, thoracic uh, vertebrae. Uh, the ribs of the lower back, uh, these are, um, I'm sorry, the vertebrae of the lower back are the lumbar uh, vertebrae. They are thicker and more solid um, because they're bearing more of the body's uh, weight. Uh, you know, the cervical vertebrae are only holding up the head, um, but the lumbar vertebrae are holding up a greater portion of the, um, uh, uh, of, uh, the body. Uh, in the hip region, because we want a very solid uh, uh, connection between our axial skeleton and our appendicular skeleton so that our legs can support the rest of our body, we have separate sacral vertebrae fuse to make one solid structure known as the sacrum. So when you were uh, an embryo and an infant, you had separate sacral vertebrae, but these then fuse to make a solid sacrum and so it is the sacrum which fuses with the hip forming the sacroiliac joint, which is a very strong, solid joint so that now um, the legs can uh, hold up uh, the weight of the body. And in the same way, uh, the remnants of the external tail uh, then uh, form a, a small fused bone known as uh, the coccyx. And you know, the external tail was lost in uh, the apes uh, so that uh, we could now be upright. All right, and so, you know, a little bit beyond in this quick introductory video, uh, but obviously uh, the structure of these bones and their form, whether, you know, uh, be the uh, articulations that they allow or the muscle attachments they allow, uh, they are what allow us to, to move uh, in the way that, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that we do. And so we could go through, you know, each of these structures and talk about its advantages. So for example, the reason that the apes lost the long tail present in, uh, you know, uh, more primitive uh, primates is so that they uh, could now uh, walk upright. And so here's a given walking upright um, because the muscles which used to move the tail are now forming a sling, um, uh, which helps to support uh, those uh, organs. And so you know, certainly we could go through the importances of um, the function. All right, so the axial skeleton is composed of the skull, the vertebral column, and uh, the rib cage, and then the ribs are joined uh, by cartilage, the first seven of them, uh, to the breastbone uh, or sternum. Um, and then when we get to the appendicular skeleton, that is the arms, the legs, and the girdles which attach them, with many of these bones, if you were really attempting to understand them, one of the things you would want to do is to study the structure so that you could distinguish between, say, left and uh, right. Um, uh, the pectoral girdle, which uh, attaches the arm to the axial skeleton, this is composed of two bones, the shoulder blade or the scapula, and then the collarbone or the clavicle. And once again, the specific structures of these bones you know, means something. So very often, you know, we see ridges, you know, and, and processes where muscles attach, et cetera. And so, for example, uh, you know, this space here, um, the supraspinous fossa is where a rotator cuff muscle, the supraspinatus, comes. This depression here, the infraspinous fossa, 
this is where uh, the uh, infraspinatus uh, originates. And so when we look at you know, uh, the spine, uh, we can see you know, muscles would attach there like the deltoid um, or the trapezius. And so if you were going to study uh, uh, bones, the structure of the bones, obviously a very relevant then to what uh, they do. Once again, these videos are here, if that is an interest uh, to you. Um, the upper arm has one single bone, uh, the humerus, all right, uh, which has a rounded projection here uh, at its proximal end because it forms a ball and socket joint, whereas at the distal end, it articulates with the two bones of the forearm, and that big hole is where the elbow, the electronon process, uh, can uh, be positioned when the arm is extended. Our forearm is made of two separate bones, the radius and uh, the ulna. And when we stand in what's known as anatomical position, the um, ulna is on the medial side, the radius is on the lateral side, the ulna has that knob, uh, which um, that forms the elbow. Um, but the radius sits in just a way that uh, the proximal end can rotate. This allows us to you know, pronate and supinate uh, the arm as the proximal end of the, uh, the radius will, you know, uh, uh, will uh, rotate and move uh, uh, over uh, the uh, ulna at, and then the distal end. Uh, the radius then articulates with two of the carpal bones. Uh, our wrist has eight uh, small uh, bones known as carpal bones, and that's, the wrist is known as the carpus. And um, uh, these uh, uh, bones are positioned in two rows of four, and perhaps of the eight, you know, if you were focusing any attention, one might be uh, on the first two, this would be the scaphoid and the lunate, because when uh, the, uh, we move the wrist joint, it is the radius uh, moving against the scaphoid and the lunate bones. Um, but then also of a special significance is this bone, the trapezium, uh, that uh, has a special joint, the saddle joint, uh, which allows us to have such, such dexterous thumbs, which obviously for uh, our you know, human manual dexterity, opposable thumbs is obviously uh, important. Uh, these carpal bones then articulate uh, with bones known as metacarpals. All right, so you know, there's one here uh, in the thumb, but that makes up much of the palm of the hand and uh, the back of the hand, these metacarpals. Um, and then we have phalanges uh, making up the fingers, uh, while the fingers themselves have three phalanges, um, the thumb has two. So we have a total of 14 phalanges in our hand. So um, that is the uh, upper uh, limb, which is part of the appendicular skeleton. And obviously, if you needed uh, to study this in greater depth, to learn where muscles go, uh, you know, because muscles have origins and uh, insertions, uh, then very often you would, you know, go into greater detail um, uh, with uh, those. Uh, we have an, uh, a, a, a leg which is attached to a pelvic girdle. Uh, now, when we were younger, we had three separate bones uh, which composed uh, the os coxa, uh, the hip, uh, but these then fuse the ilium, the ischium, and uh, the pubis to make the one uh, solid os coxa, uh, which uh, we have uh, today. And once again, you know, there are places where muscles uh, attach, and you know, it would be important, you know, for someone to have, you know, a familiarity with, you know, uh, what makes one uh, be the left or the right um, uh, os coxa. So as I said, you know, once these were three separate bones. Uh, which fused to make a solid uh, bone. Uh, the os coxa uh, then uh, articulates with the femur, and this is the body's second ball and socket joint. So the round head of the femur here then articulates in a socket known as the acetabulum on the hip. So just as our arm has one uh, bone, the humerus in the upper arm, uh, there's one bone in the thigh. And just as there are two bones in the forearm, there are two bones of the 
uh, lower uh, leg, the tibia and the uh, fibula. Uh, the fibula is the narrow bone on the lateral side, while the tibia is uh, the larger uh, bone, which makes up that prominent uh, shin. So uh, the fibula is on the lateral side. Uh, the fibula does compose part of the ankle, but it does not compose uh, the knee. The head of the fibula comes close to the knee, um, but it does not uh, you know, actually uh, compose uh, the, uh, uh, the knee. So that'll swing up in just a second. So our lower leg is uh, composed of both the, uh, the tibia and uh, the fibula. Now at the knee, as I had um, I said, we don't have um, the fibula contributing, um, but the femur does have a surface where uh, the patella or the kneecap articulates, uh, which is uh, unusual because it is a bone which forms inside a tendon. And while we do have little examples of those, uh, this uh, patella is unusually large for a sesamoid bone, which forms inside uh, a tendon there. Just as the uh, little bones of the hand are known as the corpus, the little bones of the foot are known as the tarsus. Um, there are seven of them. Uh, the uh, two perhaps most prominent ones are the uh, talus, uh, which is the only bone of the foot which articulates at the ankle joint. So our ankle is made of three bones, a, a, the tibia and the fibula of the lower leg, and then uh, the uh, talus. Um, uh, the talus. And then uh, the largest bone of the foot is the calcaneus, which forms the very prominent heel, also important because it helps to contribute uh, to the arch of uh, the foot. And so here you have, we have seven uh, uh, tarsal bones. And once again, if you were to you know, focus on uh, two primarily, the calcaneus forming the heel and the talus, which articulates with the, um, uh, the tibia and the fibula at the ankle would probably be good. Uh, and then our foot uh, is uh, also then includes the metatarsals, uh, which articulate with the uh, tarsal bones, just as the metacarpals of the hand articulate with uh, the uh, carpal bones of the hand. And then there are phalanges in the foot, uh, just as there are phalanges in uh, the hand. Once again, there are 14 uh, of them. And so uh, this was just a quick overview. Obviously, I have did more videos and uh, videos on joints and articulations um, for those who are studying the skeletal system in greater detail.